If I were to ask you what is the coldest place that you can think of, you'd probably say Antarctica, where the average temperature is a chilling 213 Kelvin, or negative 60 Celsius. Some others might say Pluto, at a frigid 43 Kelvin, or minus 230 Celsius. Astrophysicists might even say deep space, where the average temperature is about 1 Kelvin. But what if I told you there's a place 100 times colder than even that? And what if I told you that this place was on Earth? Before I get to the rest of the video, I just want to say first of all thanks so much for the support on the first few videos, I really appreciate it. I also just launched a Discord server and a Patreon, links are in the description. Also, if my voice sounds a little off right now, I'm just recovering from COVID, so I hope it's not too bad. Alright, thanks, now back to the video. In this video, I'm going to tell you about dilution refrigerators, a type of cryogenic equipment that physicists use to cool quantum computers down to 0.01 Kelvin. I'm going to break this video down into a few parts. First, I'll explain a general overview of what dilution refrigerators are. Second, I'll explain a bit about why we would ever need to get so cold. Third, I'll explain a bit about thermodynamics, the physics that lets us actually achieve such temperatures. And fourth, I'll detail how they actually achieve this temperature in a dilution refrigerator. Dilution refrigerators are technological marvels that allow physicists to cool our samples, like superconducting quantum computers, down to temperatures around 10 millikelvin. That's 0.01 kelvin, or 10 one thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. These refrigerators look like steampunk metal chandeliers, but they use the same physics principles, thermodynamics, that normal refrigerators use, only they take things to the extreme. Instead of using a refrigerant, which is the coolant liquid that normal refrigerators use, the coolant in a dilution refrigerator is liquid helium. This liquid helium circulates throughout the system, cooling it down. Dilution refrigerators cool things in stages, so as you go further and further down towards the bottom of the fridge, the temperature decreases closer and closer to absolute zero. But you may ask why we even need dilution refrigerators. Before I answer that, I want to dispel a common myth. Many people reasonably believe that dilution refrigerators are required in the case of superconducting quantum computers because you need the metal chip to superconduct, which only happens at low temperatures. However, if this were the case, in the case of most superconductors, it would be enough to get to a few Kelvin, as this is below the threshold for superconductivity in many materials. However, these quantum computer chips need to be significantly colder than this transition temperature by a factor of about 500. Why? Well, they need to be cold because of thermal noise. In a quantum computer, thermal noise can be insidious. Little thermal fluctuations, meaning stray photons radiated from the surrounding system, can take qubits that are in one state and spontaneously flip them into another state. When this happens, errors build up in the quantum computer and computations come out incorrect. So to avoid this, we need to make sure that there isn't enough energy in our thermal fluctuations to kick out qubits into different states. It just so happens that for superconducting qubits, the threshold is about 10 millikelvin. Okay. So I've told you a bit of background and why we need dilution refrigerators, but how do they actually work? After all, liquid helium does seem a little extra. First, I need to introduce a concept, the enthalpy of mixing. The heat, or enthalpy of mixing, is the quantity of energy that a substance absorbs or emits when it comes into contact with another substance. For example, hand warmers have a negative heat of mixing. In other words, they are exothermic meaning to give off heat. When you break the solid inside the hand warmer, the substances within the hand warmer mix, and that mixing releases energy as heat, warming your hands. You can also have heat of mixing be positive, meaning that the solution must absorb heat in order for the two substances to completely mix. A good example of this is sugar water. When making a simple syrup, you must heat the mixture in order for the sugar to dissolve in the water. This is because the reaction is endothermic, meaning to absorb heat, and the heat of mixing is positive. We can apply the concept of heat of mixing to ultra-cold systems to make a dilution refrigerator. Ideally what we want is a system which absorbs heat from its surroundings, just like the sugar, but instead of this happening at room temperature, like in water, we want this to happen at very low temperatures, so that we can get our system into the millikelvin regime. The dilution refrigerator works in stages. First, before we can get to the millikelvin regime, 
we need to cool down to 1 Kelvin, that's 1 degree above absolute zero. To get us part of the way down from room temperature, we cool our liquid helium with liquid nitrogen. This liquid nitrogen sits around 77 Kelvin, which is very cold, but still not cold enough. So to bring us down another large chunk of the way, we cool the helium down to its liquid phase. We do this by spraying the initially warm helium through a nozzle into a low pressure region, where it expands and cools. By doing this repeatedly in a device called a pulse tube, we can get down to about 1 Kelvin. I won't go into the specifics on how this works, but if you want to know specifics, I've linked a fantastic video by Operational Facts that explains how it works, so go check that out after this video. Anyways, we finally got into the part that you came for, getting down to ultra-cold millikelvin temperatures. A dilution refrigerator uses a special type of liquid helium, not just any run-of-the-mill boring liquid helium. Specifically, it uses a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4. These are different isotopes of helium. An isotope is just a version of an atom that has a different number of neutrons, with the same number of protons and electrons. So both helium-3 and helium-4 have two protons and two electrons, but helium-3 has one neutron and helium-4 has two neutrons. So how does it work? Well, for that, we need to draw a schematic. I'm going to borrow a lot of the explanation from a collaboration between Veritasium and Dr. Andrea Morello, a professor at University of New South Wales, because I think it does a great job illustrating what's going on. Now, we can bring in some of the thermodynamics that I was telling you guys about before. Remember the heat of mixing and how we want a process in our fridge that is endothermic so that it absorbs heat from its surroundings? Well, dilution refrigerators do this, only using the heat of mixing for the two types of helium, helium-3 and helium-4. We can illustrate this using a diagram of a U-tube. If we fill this U-tube with both helium-4 and helium-3, we get the following picture. Since helium-3 and helium-4 have different densities, they're separated by a boundary. However, some small amount of the helium-3 does dissolve into the helium-4. A good analogy here is how in a fish tank, a small amount of oxygen dissolves into the water, which allows your fish to breathe, even though most of the oxygen sits on top of the water, in the air above it, and there's a boundary. We can connect a pump to the two ends of the tube that will pump from the right side over the top and back to the left side. When we pump on the right side of the tube, we reduce the pressure. By reducing the pressure, we cause some of the helium mixture to evaporate. But the kicker is that only helium-3 evaporates out of the mixture. The reason? Well, remember helium-3 is lighter than helium-4 by a full 25%, or one neutron. So the helium-3 is easier to kick up into the gas phase. This means that we're effectively distilling helium-3 out from our mixture, similar to the way alcohol can be distilled out of water. The distillation of helium-3 reduces its percentage in the mixture, or in other words, dilutes it. This is the dilution part of dilution refrigerators. Now let's get to the refrigerator part. Since the equilibrium concentration of helium-3 and helium-4 is 6%, and we've just reduced the amount of helium-3 in the mixture by distilling some of it out, we now have more room for helium-3 from the left side of our U-tube to move into the mixture. This is where thermodynamics comes in. The movement of helium-3 into helium-4 is an endothermic process, meaning that it requires a bit of energy input to move helium-3 into the helium-4 phase. Where does this energy come from? Well, it comes from the surrounding metal tubing. So in other words, if we connect something that we want to cool down to this metal tubing, the process will cool down that something sealing its heat to move the helium-3 into the helium-4 solution. This is how scientists cool down quantum computers to millikelvin temperatures, by connecting their chips and sample holders to the part of the dilution refrigerator that gets ultra-cold, we can siphon that heat energy off into the helium mixture and thus cooling down our sample and acting as the ultimate refrigerator. Now I would be remiss not to mention that although dilution refrigerators are insanely cold, they're not actually the coldest things that we have made. Physicists have made new states of matter, like Bose-Einstein condensates, at even lower temperatures. Please let me know if these exotic phases of matter are something you guys are interested in. While the primary focus of this channel is quantum computing, I do think that these topics are absolutely fascinating in their own right, and so I'd be happy to do videos on them. If you want to learn more about the science behind quantum computers and how they work, stay tuned, because I'll have a video coming out on quantum entanglement and quantum computers soon. Until next time. I've been Lucas, this has been Lucas's Lab, and thanks for watching.